What is intelligence? How do we see the world? Is there truth without confusion? Information. The untested truths spun by different interests continue to churn and accumulate in the sandbox of political correctness and value systems. Everyone withdraws into their own small gated community afraid of a larger forum. They stay inside their little ponds, leaking whatever truth suits them into the growing cesspool of society at large. The different cardinal truths neither clash nor mesh. No one is invalidated, but nobody is right. Not even natural selection can take place here. The world is being engulfed in truth. And this is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. This is what YouTube recommends to me at night. So here you go. That's the proof of your incompetence right there. You lack the qualifications to exercise free will. That's what the computer has to say. So I thought what we should do is uh, we got to read uh, this PDF right here. <clears throat> so let us begin. Deep neural networks for YouTube recommendations. Um, Google in Mountain View. Abstract. YouTube represents one of the largest scale and most sophisticated industrial recommendation systems in existence. In this paper, we describe the system at a high level and focus on the dramatic performance improvements brought by deep learning. The paper is split according to the classic two-stage information retrieval dichotomy. First, we detail a deep candidate generation model and then describe a separate deep ranking model. We also provide practical lessons and insights derived from designing, iterating, and maintaining a massive recommendation system with enormous user-facing impact. Keywords, recommender system, deep learning, and scalability. <clears throat> Number one, the introduction. YouTube is the world's largest platform for creating, sharing, and discovering video content. YouTube recommendations are responsible for helping more than a billion users discover personalized content from an ever-growing corpus of videos. In this paper, we will focus on the immense impact deep learning has recently had on the YouTube video recommendations system. Figure one illustrates the recommendations on the YouTube mobile app home. <clears throat> Recommending YouTube videos is extremely challenging from three major perspectives. Scale. Many existing recommendation algorithms proven to work well on small problems fail to operate on our scale. Highly specialized distributed learning algorithms and efficient serving systems are essential for handling YouTube's massive user base and corpus. Freshness. YouTube has a very dynamic corpus with many hours of video <clears throat> are uploaded per second. The recommendation system should be responsive enough to model newly uploaded, uploaded content as well as the latest actions taken by the user. Balancing new content with well-established videos can be understood from an exploration or exploitation perspective. Noise. Historical user behavior on YouTube is inherently difficult to predict due to sparsity and a variety of un un unobservable external factors. We rarely obtain the ground truth of user satisfaction and instead model noisy implicit feedback signals. Furthermore, metadata associated with content is poorly structured without a well-defined ontology. Our algorithms need to be robust to these particular characteristics of our training data. In conjunction with other product areas across Google, YouTube has undergone a fundamental paradigm shift towards using deep learning as a general purpose solution for nearly all learning problems. Our system is built on Google Brain, which was recently open sourced as TensorFlow. TensorFlow provides a flexible framework for experimenting with various deep neural network architectures using large-scale distributed training. Our models learn approximately 1 billion parameters and are trained on hundreds of billions of examples. In contrast to a vast amount of research in matrix factorization methods, there is relatively little work using deep neural networks for recommendation systems. Neural networks are used for recommending news in source 17. Now, if we're interested on what source 17 would be, uh, that would be some people on in who are posting an international conference on advanced communication technology. All right, all right, that's what that was. Citations in eight, uh, review ratings in 20. So we could see citations in eight. So we're recommending citations. 
Let's see, this is an ACM conference on recommender systems. No, that was three. Sorry, that's not ACM. Uh, it was eight down here. Uh, a neural probabilistic model for context-based citation recommendation in AAAI. And they cite specific pages. And then 20 was user modeling with neural network for review rating prediction in uh, PROC IJCAI. I don't know if that's a procedure or something like that. So there you go. That is the end of that sentence. Collaborative filtering is formulated as a deep neural network in 22 and autoencoders in 18. El Conqui et al. use deep learning for cross-domain user modeling in 5. In a content-based setting, Burgess et al. use deep neural networks for music recommendation in Citation 21. I suppose I'm a little curious what kind of citation they're using for music recommendation, but again, I, I don't see any indication of which particular practical system they're referring to, right? Was the research here referred to used in uh, Spotify or Facebook? I, I have no way of knowing at this time. Uh, but that's simply because I didn't do the research. Right now I'm just trying to get the word out that people should know how YouTube works before they use it. All right, the, this paper is organized as follows. A brief system overview is presented in section two. Section three describes the candidate generation model in more detail including how it is trained and used to serve recommendations. Experimental results will show how the model benefits from deep layers of hidden units and additional heterogeneous signals. And I challenge you to figure out what that means. Section four details the ranking model, including how classic logistic regression is modified to train a model predicting expected watch time rather than click probability. Experimental results will show that hidden data layer depth is helpful as well in this situation. Finally, section five presents our conclusions and lesson learned. Uh, for those who don't know, I think the idea of a hidden layer, uh, I have a lot to learn in these categories, but I believe the idea of the hidden data layer, right, or hidden layer, uh, is basically when you have your neural network learning things uh, that aren't the direct inputs and outputs, but figuring out correlations between what's going on. Uh, so an example of that was, um, I, I uh, was, I think it was in, perhaps in a video online. I was watching a video online where someone was talking about uh, they were just playing with a neural network, and they built a robot that was simply uh, a little creature with three legs. And then they gave it, uh, basically in order for the neural network to learn, it has to have a goal, right? Uh, something based upon which to, to prune or remove part of its intelligence, you know, or increase its intelligence in one area. Otherwise, if you have no goal, uh, intelligence is effectively meaningless. But so he had this little three-legged robot, and he, he gave it uh, that the reward function to the neural network deciding how it should move would be the distance that it was able to travel. So he had this robot that uh, initially just floundered randomly, but over time uh, learned to travel from place to place on, on the ground. And and one of one of the experiments I think was then he, he cut a leg off the robot to try to see how it would flounder and whether it would learn to maneuver without that other leg. Uh, but one of the really interesting things that he said after that experiment was that within the hidden data layers of the neural network, it had begun to create um, correlations like like an, you know a neuron in one case that, that represented whether or not it was capable of seeing a human nearby because that had a really significant impact on whether it was going to be you know tortured or moved around with this robot or something like that uh so the, the idea of a hidden data layer in in uh neural networks right would be that even though you have a set input and a set output it begins to formulate uh deeper you know more advanced correlations between that that's that's my limited understanding obviously there's more to it than that. So let's, let's go back to the reading. Experimental results will show that hidden layer depth is helpful as well in this situation. Finally, section five presents our conclusions and lessons learned. Uh, system overview. The overall structure of our recommendation system is illustrated in figure two. The system is comprised of two neural networks, one for candidate generation and one for ranking. The candidate generation network takes events from the user's YouTube activity history as input and retrieves a small subset of hundreds of videos from a large corpus. These candidates are intended to be generally relevant to the user with high precision. The candidate generation network only provides broad personalization via collaborative filtering. The similarity between users is expressed in terms of course features such as IDs of video watches, search query tokens, and demographics. Presenting a few best recommendations on a list requires a fine level representation to distinguish relative importance among candidates with high recall. The ranking network accomplishes this task by assigning a score to each video according to a desired objective function 
using a rich set of features describe, describing the video and user. The highest scoring videos are presented to the user, ranked by their score. The two-stage approach to recommendation allows us to make recommendations from a very large corpus, millions, of videos while still being certain that the small number of videos appearing on the device are personalized and engaging for the user. Furthermore, this design enables blending candidates generated by other sources, such as those described in an earlier work, in, uh, in work three, which would be, uh, that was the one that was on the proceedings of the fourth ACM conference on recommendation systems. So that was, that was work three. <clears throat> During development, we make extensive use of offline metrics, precision, recall, ranking loss, etc., to guide iterative improvements to our system. However, for the final determination of the effectiveness of an algorithm or model, we rely on A-B testing via live experiments. In a live experiment, we can measure sub subtle changes in click-through rate, watch time, and many other metrics that measure user engagement. This is important because live A-B results are not always correlated with offline experiments. Part 3. Candidate Generation During candidate generation, the enormous YouTube corpus is winnowed down to hundreds of videos that may be relevant to the user. The predecessor to the recommendations described here was a matrix factorization approach trained under rank loss, uh, which is in Citation 23. Early iterations of our neural network model mimicked this factorization behavior with shallow networks that only embedded the user's previous watches. From this perspective, our approach can be viewed as nonlinear generalization of factorization techniques. Recommendation as classification. We pose recommendation as extreme multi-class classification, where the prediction problem becomes accurately classifying a specific video, watch, W sub T, at a time T, among millions of videos, I, classes, from a corpus, V, based on a user, U, and context, C. So here we have this function, uh, we're using sort of that probability notation, they'll use an upper level probability math. We have the probability that W sub T equals I, given that uh, U and C are the case, uh, a given user and context. So like given, you know, a particular user and context, what is the probability uh, of a video watch at time T among millions of videos? And here they're saying that that probability would be equal to uh, e raised to the power of v sub i u, which I don't think they've told us what v sub i and u are. So obviously, uh, you, you wouldn't immediately know what this was doing when they give it to you here because they haven't told us what v sub i and u are. Uh, and it looks like we're also looking at the sum of all videos, uh, which we're dividing by on that probability, which we don't, we don't have the e, j yet. So we got to read, read about what v and j are. <clears throat> so we're saying that where uh, u is something in uh, R of N, which in upper, upper level mathematics usually re uh, refers to <coughs> the space of real numbers. <clears throat> For example, R3 is three dimensional, uh, R4 is like four dimensions. So they're saying that U would, is uh, uh, probably a larger vector. <clears throat> uh, right here, as they say, represents a high dimensional embedding of the user uh, context pair. And V sub J in R of N represents embedding of each candidate video. So you have the vector of all the things of the candidate video, and you have the vector of the user video. And I guess we're multiplying those together uh, to figure out that probability. In this setting, an embedding is simply a mapping of sparse entities, individual videos, users, etc., into a dense vector in R N. The task of the deep neural network is to learn user embeddings U as a function of the user's history and context that are useful for discriminating among videos with a softmax classifier. Now, I don't know what a softmax classifier is. Maybe you do, but that would be something you could research. Although explicit feedback mechanisms exist on YouTube, thumbs up, down, and product surveys, etc. Uh, we use the implicit feedback, 16, of watches to train the model, where a user completing a video is a positive example. <clears throat> this choice is based on the orders of magnitude, uh, more implicit user history available, allowing us to produce recommendations deep in the tail where explicit feedback is extremely far sparse. <clears throat> Efficient extreme multiclass. 
To efficiently train such a model with millions of classes, we rely on a technique to sample negative classes from the background distribution, here called candidate sampling, and then correct for this sampling via importance weighting. Let me read that again. That was a long sentence. To efficiently train such a model with millions of classes, we rely on a technique to sample negative classes from the background distribution. So negative classes, so candidate sampling. And then correct for this sampling via importance weighting. So we're going we're gonna to be weighting the importance. So we're going to use that to, to correct uh, some of the negative class sampling. For each example, the cross entropy loss is minimized for the true label and the sampled negative classes. In practice, several thousand negatives are sampled, corresponding to more than 100 times speed up over tra traditional softmax. A popular alternative approach is hierarchical softmax, which is in uh, citation 15, but we weren't able to achieve comparable accuracy. In hierarchical softmax, so softmax, excuse me, hierarchical softmax, traversing each node in the tree involves discriminating between sets of classes that are often unrelated making the classification problem much more difficult and degrading performance. At serving time, we need to compute the most likely N classes or videos in order to choose the top N to present to the user. Scoring millions of items under a strict serving latency of tens of milliseconds uh, requires an approximate scoring scheme, sublinear in the number of classes. Previous systems at YouTube relied on hashing in Citation 24, and the classifier described here uses a similar approach. Since calibrated likelihoods from the softmax output layer are not needed at serving time, the scoring problem reduces to a near nearest neighbor search in the dot product space for which general purpose libraries can be used. We found that AAB results were not particularly sensitive to the choice of nearest neighbor search algorithm. <clears throat> 3.2, model architecture. Inspired by continuous bag of words language models in Citation 14, we learn high dimensional embeddings for each video in a fixed vocabulary and feed those embeddings into a feed forward neural network. A user's watch history is represented by a variable length sequence of sparse video IDs, which is mapped to a dense vector representation via the embeddings. The network requires fixed sized dense inputs and simply averaging the embeddings performed best among several strategies the sum, the component wise max, etc. <clears throat> Importantly, the embeddings are learned jointly with all other model parameters through normal gradient descent back propagation updates. Features are concentrated, or excuse me, features are concatenated into a wide first layer, followed by several layers of fully connected rectified linear units, uh, hereafter referred to as RELU apparently from citation six. Figure three shows the general network architecture with additional non-video watch features described below. Hmm. Heterogeneous signals. A key advantage of using deep neural networks as a generalization of matrix factorization is that arbitrary, continuous, and categorical features can be easily added to the model. Search history is treated similarly to watch history. Each qu uh, query is tokenized into unigrams and bigrams, and each token is embedded. Once averaged, the user's tokenized embedded queries represent a summarized dense search history. Demographic features are important for providing priors so that the recommendations behave reasonably for new users. The user's geographic region and device are embedded and concatenated. Simple binary and continuous features such as the user's gender, logged in state, and age are input directly to the network as real values normalized to zero or one. <clears throat> Example age feature. Many hours worth of videos are uploaded each second to YouTube. Recommending this recently uploaded, fresh content is extremely important for YouTube as a product. We consistently observe that users prefer fresh content, though not at the expense of relevance. In addition to the first order effect of simply recommending new videos that users want to watch, there is a critical secondary phenomenon of bootstrapping and propagating viral content. Machine learning systems often exhibit an implicit bias towards the past because they are, they are trained to predict future behavior from historical examples. The distribution of video popularity is highly non-stationary, but the multinomial distribution over the corpus produced by our recommender 
will reflect the average watch likelihood in the training window of several weeks. To correct for this, we feed the age of the training example as a feature during training. At serving time, this feature is set to zero or slightly negative to reflect that the model is making predictions at the very end of the training window. Figure four demonstrates the efficacy of this approach on an arbitrarily chosen video. So here we see the baseline model uh, with example age and the empirical distribution, which we see here is the baseline model with example age and the empirical distribution class probability. Hmm. For a given video, citation 26, the model trained with example age as a feature is able to accurately represent the upload time and time dependent popularity observed in the data. Without the feature, the model would predict approximately the average likelihood over the training window. Hmm. Label and context selection. It is important to emphasize that recommendation often involves solving a surrogate problem and transferring the result to a particular context. A classic example is the assumption that accurately predicting ratings leads to effective movie recommendations. We have found that the choice of this surrogate learning problem has an outsized importance on performance in A-B testing, but is very difficult to measure with offline experiments. Training examples are generated from all YouTube watches, even those embedded on other sites, rather than just watches on the recommendations we produce. Otherwise, it would be very difficult for new content to surface, and the recommender would be overly biased towards exploitation. <clears throat> if users are discovering videos through means other than our recommendations, we want to be able to quickly propagate this discovery to others via collaborative filtering. Another key insight that improved live metrics was to generate a fixed number of training examples per user, effectively weighting our users equally in the loss function. This prevented a small co cohort of highly active users from dominating the loss. Somewhat counterintuitively, great care must be taken to withhold information from the classifier in order to prevent the model from exploiting the structure of the site and overfitting the surrogate problem. Consider as an example the case in which the user has just issue, issued a search query for Taylor Swift. Since our problem is posed as predicting the next watched video, a classifier given this information will predict that the most likely videos to be watched are those which appear on the corresponding search result pages for Taylor Swift, unsurprisingly reproducing the user's last search page as homepage recommendations performs very poorly. By discarding sequence information, and representing search queries with an unordered bag of tokens, the classifier is no longer directly aware of the origin of the label. Natural consumption patterns of videos typically lead to very asymmetric co-watch probabilities. Episodic series are usually watched sequentially, and users often discover artists in a genre beginning with the most broadly popular before focusing on smaller niches. We therefore found much better performance predicting the user's next watch rather than predicting a randomly held out watch, such as figure five. Many collaborative filtering systems implicitly chose the labels and context by holding out a random item and predicting it from other items in the user's history. This leaks future information and ignores any asymmetric consumption patterns. In contrast, we roll back a user's history by choosing a random watch and only input actions the user took before the held out watch label, such as in 5B. Part 3.5, experiments with features and depth. Adding features in depth significantly improves precision on holdout data as shown in figure six. In these experiments, a vocabulary of 1 million videos and 1 million search tokens were embedded with 256 floats each in a maximum bag size of 50 recent watches and 50 recent searches. The softmax layer outputs a multinomial distribution over the same 1 million video classes with a dimension of 256, which can be thought of as a separate output video embedding. These models were trained until convergence over all YouTube users corresponding to several epochs over the data. Network structure followed a common tower pattern in which the bottom of the network is widest and each successive hidden layer halves the number of units, similar to figure three. Uh, it looks like maybe that's what's going on here. I haven't been focusing too heavily on the figures, but. Uh, there you go. The depth zero network is effectively a linear factorization scheme. 
which performed very similarly to the prede predecessor system. Width and depth were added until the incremental, incremental benefit diminished and convergence became difficult. Depth zero. A linear layer simply transforms the concatenation layer to match the softmax dimension of 256. Depth one, 256, ReLU. Depth two, or maybe it's RELU. 512 RELU to 256 RELU. Depth 3, 1024 RELU to 512 RELU, which goes to 256 RELU. And depth 4 is 2048 RELU to 1024 RELU, which then goes to 512 RELU, which goes on, as you would expect, to 256. Uh, curiously, we might want to look at this, uh, this picture here for a moment. So you have the nearest neighbor index, and we have class probabilities. Uh, which is getting predicted. And I guess this is all coming from the embedded video watches and the embedded search tokens. So we put that in here. And we have uh, example age. I think that's the age of the thing we're looking at. I don't think that's like user age, right? But then we have the uh, the gender of the user, which uh, apparently is very significant in these decisions and is binary. You're either one or zero. Uh, so we have that. And then uh, it goes through this, and it ends up figuring out nearest neighbor index and soft max. It goes to the class probabilities. Kind of makes sense in a certain kind of way that I have a lot to learn about. All right, uh, number four, ranking. The primary role of ranking is to use impression data to specialize and calibrate candidate predictions for the particular user interface. For example, a user may watch a given video with high probability, generally but is unlikely to click on the specific homepage impression due to the choice of thumbnail image. During ranking, we have access to many more features describing the video and the user's relationship to the video because only a few hundred videos are being scored rather than the millions scored in candidate generation. Ranking is also crucial for ensembling different candidate sources whose scores are not directly comparable. We use a deep neural network with similar architecture as candidate generation to assign an independent score to each video impression using logistic regression. Figure 7. The list of videos is then sorted by the score and returned to the user. Our final ranking objective is constantly being tuned based on live A-B testing results, but is generally a simple function of expected watch time per impression. Ranking by click-through rate often promotes deceptive videos that the user does not complete clickbait, whereas watch time better captures engagement, uh, which we see in citation 13 and 25. Part 4.1, feature representation. Our features are segregated with the traditional taxonomy of categorical and continuous or ordinal features. The categorical features we use vary widely in their cardinality. Some are binary, e.g. whether the user is logged in, while others have millions of possible values e.g. the user's last search query. Features are further split according to whether they contribute only a single value, univalent, or a set of values, multivalent. An example of a univalent categorical feature is the video ID of the impression being scored, while a corresponding multivalent feature might be a bag of the last n video IDs the user has watched. We also classify features according to whether they describe properties of the item impression, or properties of the user context, the query. Query features are computed once per request, while impression features are computed for each item scored. Feature engineering. We typically use hundreds of features in our ranking models, roughly split evenly between categorical and continuous, despite the promise of deep learning to alleviate the burden of engineering features by hand. The nature of our raw data does not easily lend itself to be input directly into feedforward neural networks we still expend considerable engineering resources transforming user and video data into useful features. The main challenge is in representing a temporal sequence of user actions and how these actions relate to the video impression being scored. We observe that the most important signals are those that describe a user's previous interaction with the item itself and other similar items. <clears throat> and other similar items, sorry matching others' experience in ranking ads. As an example, consider the user's past history with the channel that uploaded the video being scored. How many videos has the user watched from this channel? When was the last time the user watched a video on this topic? 
These continuous features describing past user actions on, a, on related items are particularly powerful because they generalize well across disparate items. We have also found it crucial to propagate, propagate information from candidate generation into ranking in the form of features, e.g. which sources nominated this video candidate. What scores did they assign? Features describing the frequency of past video impressions are also critical for introducing churn in recommendations. Successive requests do not return identical lists. If a user was recently recommended a video but did not watch it, then the model will naturally demote this impression on the next page load. Serving up to the second impression and watch history is an engineering feat unto itself outside the scope of this paper, but is vital for producing responsive recommendations. Embedding categorical features. Similar to candidate generation, we use embeddings to map sparse categorical features to dense representations suitable for neural networks. Each unique ID space, vocabulary, <clears throat> has a separate learned embedding with dimension that increases approximately proportional to the logarithm of the number of unique values. These vocabularies are simple lookup tables, built by passing over the data once before training. Very large cardinality ID spaces, e.g. video IDs or search query terms, are truncated by including only the top n after sorting based on their frequency in clicked impressions. Out of vocabulary values are simply mapped to the zero embedding. As in candidate generation, multivalent categorical feature embeddings are averaged before being fed to the network. Importantly, categorical features in the same ID space also share underlying embeddings. For example, there exists a single global embedding of video IDs that many distinct features use. Video ID of the impression, last video ID watched by the user, video ID that seeded the recommendation, etc. Despite the shared embedding, each feature is fed separately into the network so that the layers above can learn specialized representations per feature. Sharing embeddings is important for improving generalization, speeding up training, and reducing memory requirements. The overwhelming majority of model parameters are in these high cardinality embedding spaces. For example, 1 million IDs embedded in a 32-dimensional space have seven times more parameters than fully connected layers to, uh, 2048 units wide. That was a really interesting sentence, and I kind of want to read it again. The overwhelming majority of model parameters are in these high cardinality embedding spaces. For example, 1 million IDs embedded in a 32-dimensional space have seven times more parameters than fully connected layers 2,048 units wide. I have a lot to learn about what these, about how to build neural networks. It's something I need to do more of. But I'm going to continue reading for those interested. Normalizing continuous features. Neural networks are notoriously sensitive to the scaling and distribution of their inputs, whereas alternative approaches such as ensembles of decision trees are invariant to scaling of individual features. We found that proper normalization of continuous features was critical for convergence. A continuous feature X with distribution F is transformed into uh, X bar by scaling the values such that the feature is equally distributed in the set of 0 up to 1 where the 0 is inclusive and the 1 is exclusive. Using the cumulative distribution X bar equals the integral from negative infinity to X uh, DF. This integral is approximated with linear interpolation on the quantiles of the future values computed in a single pass over the data before training begins. In addition to the raw normalized feature X bar, we also import Excuse me, we also input powers x bar squared in the square root of x bar, giving the network more expressive power by allowing it to easily form super and sublinear functions of the feature. Feeding powers of continuous features was found to improve offline accuracy. Part 4.2 Modeling expected watch time. Our goal to predict expected watch time given training examples that are either positive, the video impression was clicked, or negative, the impression was not clicked. Positive examples are annotated with the amount of time the user spent watching the video. To predict expected watch time, we use the technique of weighted logistic regression, which was developed for this purpose. The model is trained with logistic regression under cross-entropy loss, 
which is shown in figure 7. However, the positive clicked impressions are weighted by the observed watch time on the video. Negative or unclicked impressions all receive unit weight. In this way, the odds learned by the logistic regression are the sum of all t sub i divided by the difference of n minus k, where n is the number of training examples, k is the number of positive impressions, and t sub i is the watch time of the ith impression. Assuming the fraction of positive impressions is small, which is true in our case, the learned odds are approximately uh, the expectation of t given uh, 1 plus p. I'm not sure if that's given. I may not be reading that correctly. Where p is the click probability and, and e of t, the expectation of t. Um, I think it's a function, right? It's the expectation of t, which is a function of 1 plus p. I think. Where p is the click probability and expectation of t is the expected watch time of the impression. Since p is small, this product is close to the expectation of t. For inference, we use the exponential function e to the x as the final activ activation function to produce these odds that, that closely estimate expected watch time. Part 4.3, experiments with hidden layers. Table 1 shows the results we obtained on next day holdout data with different hidden layer configurations. The value shown for each configuration, weighted per user loss, was obtained by considering both positive, clicked, and negative, unclicked impressions shown to a user on a single page. We first score these impressions with our model. If the negative impression receives a higher score than the positive impression, then we consider the positive impression's watch time to be mispredicted watch time. Weighted per user loss is then the total amount mispredicted watch time as a fraction of total watch time over held out impression pairs. These results show that increasing the width of hidden layers improves results as does increasing their depth. The trade-off, however, is server CPU time needed for inference. The configuration of a 1024-wide uh, RELU followed by a 512-wide RELU followed by a 256-wide RELU gave us the best results while enabling us to stay within our serving CPU budget. For the 1024 to 512 to 256 model, we tried only feeding the normalized continuous features without their powers, which increased loss by 0.2%. With the same hidden layer configuration, we also trained the model where positive and negative examples are weighted equally. Unsurprisingly, this increased the watch time weighted loss by a dramatic 4.1%. By a dramatic 4.1%. Part five, conclusions. We have described our deep neural network architecture for recommending YouTube videos, split into two distinct problems, candidate generation and ranking. Our deep collaborative filtering model is able to effectively assimilate many signals and model their interaction with layers of depth, outperforming previous matrix factorization approaches used at YouTube, which you can read about in, uh, in uh, 23, in, you know, in uh, citation 23. There is more art than science in selecting the surrogate problem for recommendations, and we found classifying a future watch to perform well on live metrics by capturing asymmetric co-watch behavior and preventing leakage of future information. Withholding discriminative signals from the classifier was also essential to achieving good results. Otherwise, the model would overfit the surrogate problem and not transfer well to the home page. We demonstrated that using the age of the training example as an input feature removes an inherent bias towards the past and allows the model to represent the time-dependent behavior of popular videos. This improved offline holdout precision results and increased the watch time dramatically on recently uploaded videos in A-B testing. Ranking is a more classical machine learning problem, yet our deep learning approach outperformed previous linear and tree-based methods for watch time prediction. Recommendation systems, in particular, benefit from specialized features describing past user behavior with items. Deep neural networks require special representations of categorical and continuous features, which we transform with embeddings and quantile normalization, respectively. Layers of depth were shown to effectively model non-linear interactions between hundreds of features. Logistic regression was modified by weighting training examples with watch time for positive examples and unity for negative examples, allowing us to learn odds that closely model expected watch time. This approach performed much better on watch time weighting ranking uh, on watch time weighted ranking. 
evaluation metrics compared to predicting click-through rate directly. Let me only read that sentence again. I didn't read it very well. This approach performed much better on watch time weighted ranking evaluation metrics compared to predicting click-through rate directly. I think again in this sentence, they're reiterating how effective it is um, for them to suggest videos to you based on the odd, like the, the, the probability that you're going to spend a lot of time watching the video versus the probability that you would just click on it straight away. Uh, because this allows them to sort of outmaneuver clickbait images. Part six, acknowledgements. The authors would like to thank Jim McFadden and Pranav Kaitan for valuable guidance and support. Sujit Bansal, Shripad Thait, and Radek Vingralek implemented key components of the training and serving infrastructure. Chris Berg and Trevor Walker contributed thoughtful discussion and detailed feedback. And now below we have the references, or I guess I often called them citations. So there you have it. If you'd like uh, my suggestion and why I why I chose to read this uh, this this text today, uh, I I am beginning to believe uh, that it would only be wise for you to watch a YouTube video if you understand everything that I just said. You might, and you might not. I'm sure there are some people who understand everything I just said much better than I do, and other people who do not. Uh, suffice it to say that when you are being measured by a system this complicated, and, and this this uh, this documentation here obviously only touches the very, very, very tip of an iceberg of how the system functions, which you ought to understand before you go and use it. Um, if you're going to use that system, I guess is what I was trying to say, and and using that system, you're you're going to make that a part of your life, a daily, uh, you know, a daily ritual is a part of a part of how you live. I, I think that as as well as understanding all of this, uh, you should probably prepare to uh, to utilize an equal level of intelligence to benefit your own self. For example, when you think about it, right, every time that you click a video on YouTube, that video gets incorporated in, into this corpus of videos and affects the subset that they're talking about that they'll show you uh, for you know sort of the candidate selection uh, and, and probably will impact which candidates are going to be selected for you. So knowing that that is happening, right, and you're getting, you know, you're sort of getting this little little scoped out view of the world that's a, that's a, a much smaller view than the, than the entire corpus. Uh, and then, you know, we have ranking within, within those candidates. Uh, I think it would be important to keep in mind how much the your view of the world, if if things that act, enter your brain come from YouTube, is being trimmed to only this very small group of of a hundred or more candidates at any given time. So knowing that the system is going to make recommendations, that's going to bring your mind into a very trimmed down, um, you know, sort of digitally separated, scoped out view of the world. Um, while that's happening, I think it would be in your best interest to do this same amount of research and have an equivalently complicated system uh, that was then working to your benefit for learning new things, reaching outside your selected candidates and looking in the entire corpus, uh, and generally uh, just not interacting with the system at all because the goal function of the system is maximum watch time, whereas the goal function of your life probably ought to be minimum watch time, to be totally honest with you. Uh, so knowing that to be the case, uh, first off, I'd like to say uh, thank you to, because you're going to click the, uh, the recommended videos on the side of this video, because you have no choice. Uh, the, a, a larger system superior to your brain and smarter than you has already decided your future with very high probability uh, and will have recommended on the side of this video uh, one that you will watch simply because you have no choice, because you've chosen to uh, interact with this uh, superior system that, that outdoes your own goal functions of your brain because you believe you don't care, of course. Um, so uh, I thank you for uh, for engaging in the system that has brought us to a world where you could listen to me read this today. But uh, I hope you take something away from this, and I hope that your life is improved by uh, remembering the significance of simple weightings of probability and systems of ranking and understanding and how it would probably be your benefit to learn how deep learning and deep neural networks function. Thank you, and I hope you have a genuinely good day.